Dr. Richard Pick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just some background. I was born in Chicago in 1960. Uh, my parents were Polish immigrants. Uh, they were refugees of the Second World War. Uh, the story is a story of deportation and exile, <clears throat> the story of two families and how they settled in the United States. I dedicate this talk to my parents. This is a picture of my father and my mother, Mitchell Panik and Helena Smoczynska Panik, with my son Mitchell, Walter Panik, who was named after my father in Florida. This is a picture of my father with uh, my daughter Genevieve, who is named after my mother's mother, Genoveva. Attribution for the stories are obviously first-hand accounts from Mitchell and Helena Panic, uh, Wallace and Sophia Shabel. Sophia was uh, my father Mitchell's uh, sister, my aunt. Uh, also another sister, Ale Alexandra Shlodowska. And uh, we're going to, the other source is a family genealogy, which was uh, compiled by my wife, Mary Lehman Panic in 1997. <laughs> The background for this information, first I have to backtrack a little bit. I'm a board member of the Polish Heritage Society, and this past year I presented a talk, I presented this talk for the Polish Heritage Society. Uh, a year before, Dr. B uh, Barbara Rilko Bauer, who is an anthropologist at GVSU, did a talk uh, about her mother's immigration story. And her mother was a Polish doctor in the Nazi concentration camps. This is a book that's published. You can purchase it on Amazon. It's an excellent book. Does some of you read that? Yeah. <clears throat> Dr. Bauer's presentation inspired me to kind of tell the story of my parents. And uh, Dr. Bauer uh, uh, encouraged me to do so. And she recommended that we do some investigation and try to get some more scholarly work that uh, kind of documents what actually happened to Poles in Russia during the Second World War. And one of these texts is the uh, text uh, Deportation and Exile, uh, written by Keith Sword. Uh, of the, uh, he was a member of the faculty at the University of London Institute of Slavonic Studies. And with the release of Soviet archives in the late uh, 80s and early 90s, he was able to document a lot of these stories that were previously kind of unknown in the West. Poles in India, the orange text that you see on the screen, was a book that was compiled by a uh, group of uh, Poles who were the actual refugees who lived in uh, the refugee settlement camps and orphanages in India after the war. That's where my parents lived in India for a period of time. The, the photos you'll see on the presentation are personal family photos, uh, as well as images I grabbed from Google. Uh, I didn't do research for attribution, so uh, this is not being uh, reproduced for commercial purposes. The videography is for the benefit of my uh, siblings and cousins who were not able to attend this talk today. A couple of uh, definitions we want to go through. Uh, these are some acronyms that you might see in the presentation. The NKVD uh, was a People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs. They were the precursor to the KGB and were Stalin's right arm in um, setting up the political system in occupied Poland. Uh, the Gulag is basically, everybody knows what the Gulag is, but the Gulag is actually the term for the div division of the NKVD that oversaw the labor camps and prisons in Soviet Russia. DPs are displaced persons. It's an official term uh, that was on my, patient, uh, my parents' immigration pa papers. These are either war or political refugees uh, who cannot return home for obvious reasons. Uh, VOLOGs are volunteer, voluntary aid organizations that were active during the Second World War and are still active today, helping resettle refugees he even here in Grand Rapids. My wife Mary put together this family tree in 1997 and through access to uh, the marriage certificates of my parents, as well as uh, baptismal certificates, we were able to trace the, the family tree back a few generations. We're going to concentrate on uh, the struggles of my parents, Mitchell and Helena uh, Panik. Um, Mitchell Panik's uh, parents were Władysław and Maria. Uh, Władysław is Polish for Walter. And uh, Helena, my mother's parents, were Władysław Smoczynski and Genoveva, so uh, another Walter and Genoveva is Genevieve. 
Walter Panik was born in 1894 in Poland and died in 1962 in Chicago. Uh, I never really knew him because I was two years old when he passed. Uh, I've seen some old eight millimeter movies uh, when I was uh, alive at the time and, and he was in some of these films. So it's kind of neat to see him, but yet again to hear some of the stories about uh, who he was and how he was from uh, older cousins. Maria Ledvoin Panik uh, was born in 1894 and died in 1982 in Chicago. She was actually born in Buffalo, New York, so she was a United States citizen. And that would affect some of the immigration status of, of the Panik family. Władysław Smoczynski, my mother's father, was born in Mała Poland uh, near Dębica and died in Chicago. And uh, Władysław uh, was, uh, his career was, he was a policeman um, at the time the war broke out. Uh, my father's father was a farmer. Genovifa Rymuc Smoczynska, my grandmother, was born in Rupchitz and died in Lindenhurst, Illinois in 1988. Uh, she lived to see her, uh, her great-granddaughter Genevieve. Give you some background on the history of Poland. Are there any people of Polish background in the audience? Okay, so bear with me if, you've, if this is something you're familiar with. But uh, the Poland was instituted, or Poland is recognized as uh, uh, being born in the year 966 when uh, Prince Mieszko uh, was baptized and his court was baptized. So it's considered the Christianization of Poland. In uh, the year 1000, the Congress of Gniezno, which was the capital of Poland at that time, uh, Bolesław the Great met with uh, Leo III, who was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, and Poland achieved recognition as an independent kingdom within the empire. Uh, by the year 1180, uh, a Sejm was formed. A Sejm is a, the Polish version of a parliament. And the uh, method of government of the kingdom at that time was to elect a king. There were nobles, so it was a tribal type of uh, origin. Uh, the nobles were landowners and they would get together and in their collective wisdom, uh, elect the person who would function as king of the, uh, of the government. The, uh, the glory, the height of glory of Polish history was in 1493 with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, which was a republic under the presidency uh, of the king elected by the Shlachta. By that time, the nobility was recognized as a separate class called the Shlachta. Um, and uh, they held a lot of power in the government. Uh, this shows the extent of the, the kingdom of Poland uh, between the years of 1386 and 1434. The kingdom extended almost from the Baltic to the Black Sea. Uh, on the map, we see the kingdom of Poland and the Principality of Lithuania. So they were still electing kings, but the kings were uh, marrying uh, nobility from other countries and royalty of other countries, and uh, they were able to form a commonwealth. As far as the history of pre-war Poland, uh, what kind of led up to the events uh, around World War I, there was a partition of the Polish-Lithuanian commonwealth because the nobility had some say in the run of the country. Uh, the king had limited, uh, it was not an autocracy at all. And as a result, uh, foreign influences were able to creep in and uh, bend the ear of the nobility and uh, turn uh, political uh, policy in their favor. So neighboring countries increasingly gained influence in the government. Uh, there was passed in 1791 a May Constitution, uh, which was the second uh, formal written constitution in the world, second only to the United States Constitution, which was written in 1776, as a way of uh, improving or uh, more democratizing the system of government uh, to bring control more to the people. But it was too little too late. By 1795, there was a final partition of Poland under the kingdoms of Austria and Russia. And in uh, 1815, uh, Congress Poland was uh, instituted. It was a small kingdom under the direct uh, uh, control of the Tsar of Russia. So the Congress Poland was founded uh, under the Congress of Vienna. Uh, the Congress of Vienna was uh, uh, the outcome 
of the Napoleonic Wars, where uh, Napoleon was fighting against Russia and in his defeat had to give up territory. So the Kingdom of Napoleon, as you see on this map of 1815, the Kingdom of Poland was under Russian rule. World War II broke out in 1914. Uh, as we know, uh, the Serbians were struggling for independence and autonomy uh, with the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, hostilities broke out. Austria got onto a war footing, was quickly followed by Germany, and Russia came to the aid of the Balkans. During that time, Poland was not an autonomous country. They were under the influence of Russia, and there were ethnic Poles that were living in the Western Poland under the, uh, the rule of the Austrians. Uh, Joseph Piłsudski was a Polish socialist revolutionary uh, who helped form Polish legions, the first active Polish army in generations established in Galicia, which was in Austria in 1914. It was basically what constitutes now Western Poland. The formation of the legions was declared in August of 1914 and the Austrian government, uh, needing troops to fight against the Russians, uh, agreed to the formation. A little background of what was going on in Russia at the time. Uh, prior to the Soviet Revolution, there was a re revolution against the Tsar in 1905. Uh, the Tsar uh, Nicholas uh, of Russia was extremely autocratic and held supreme power. There was a form of uh, uh, government um, or legislature, uh, but they were uh, totally ruled over by the diktats of the Tsar. Uh, Russia entered uh, World War I in 1914 in defense of the Balkans, and by 1916, uh, Russia had lost two million troops. Uh, there was further foment and revolution by the Bolsheviks and liberals uh, trying to get a more democratic form of government uh, to uh, overthrow the Tsar, and as a result of loss of political power, the Tsar abdicated in 1917, leading up to the Bolshevik Revolution. The Bolsheviks uh, placed the Tsar and his entire family under house arrest and assassinated them in 1918. Russia was destitute, uh, was out of money, uh, expended not only manpower, but uh, tremendous amount of resources in the First World War and decided to call a truce with Germany prior to the uh, end of hostilities in 1918. The outcome, the immediate outcome of the uh, Treaty of Versailles was the formation of the Polish Second Republic. Uh, Poland was a new, uh, an independent, autonomous country once again, uh, the first time since 1795. And in 1918, they still had enemies on either side. There's animosity between Germans and Poles because the settlement of the Treaty of Versailles was the Germans had to give up Eastern German territory to the Poles. Uh, Russia also was eager to expand Soviet communism westward. And the reason is uh, the Bolsheviks uh, to uh, uh, promote communism and the growth of the proletariat really had to confiscate private property. And they, were, uh, they needed capital to keep the country running. And because Russia was largely agrarian at the time of the revolution, uh, there was very little uh, infrastructure for manufacturing, uh, for development, and uh, Lenin and subsequently Stalin knew the only way to, for communism to succeed would be for communism to also prosper and flourish in Western Europe. So the goal was always to expand communism towards the West. Once again, Joseph Pilsudski, with the formation of the Polish Republic in 1918, he became chief of staff and the first marshal of Poland. Uh, there were conflicts with uh, Soviet Russia in the 1920s, and he fought off the Soviet invasion of, of Poland in 1920, which extended some of the Polish borders through the Treaty of Riga. Pilsudski then uh, left uh, official uh, uh, leadership of the government, uh, maintained a position as a minister of defense, uh, but got increasingly frustrated with the lack of power of the government. He was a socialist at heart, uh, did not like some of the uh, nationalist democratic uh, leanings of the government, and staged a coup in 1926, where he took control, but then again, 
uh, was able to corral these different factions, which include different parties, the Nationalist Party, the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, and peasant parties in Poland. This is, uh, these are some posters, propaganda posters, from the uh, Russian or Polish Bolshevik War. Uh, on the left, the poster says, uh, be Bolshevika, beat the Bolsheviks. And here it says, if you don't go into the field with your brother's soldiers, jutro odash frisko pod Bolshevikim batem. So you can see the rhyme. You will lose all under the bowls of a baton. What are you waiting for? So the Bolshevik threat was uh, understood in, in Poland at the time. So this is a map that shows the extension of the borders from those different conflicts with Russia. <clears throat> Russia, after World War I, excuse me. <clears throat> after World War I, the, the Bolsheviks were in control, but they were fighting a war with uh, the former supporters of the Tsar. So the Red Army, the Soviet Red Army, uh, was in civil war with the White <coughs> Army. Uh, which was supported by more de democratic-leaning uh, uh, individuals. The civil war in Russia ended in 1921, and the Soviet Union was formally uh, chartered in 1922, the Union being uh, the countries in neighboring areas like Kazakhstan, uh, uh, Uzbekistan, becoming parts of the Soviet Socialist Republics. Um, Unfortunately, five million people died on, during two years of famine shortly after formation of the Soviet Union. And there was an anti-religious campaign. Uh, I don't know if it was Lenin or Stalin that said religion is the opiate of the republic. And it was found as an impediment to the expansion of uh, socialist communism. Uh, the government was responsible for the killing of 8,000 priests, monks, and nuns. Uh, they were confiscating private property. Uh, there were stories, and some of the background was uh, from the text to Russia in 1891 to 1991 from Orlando Figs. Stories of uh, priests trying to put up a fight and uh, uh, Russian troops were trying to confiscate any type of metal products from sanctuaries, from belfries. And uh, uh, stories of priests being murdered by being thrown off the belfry to their death. In 1924, Stalin took power after the death of Lenin. And interesting to learn, Stalin and Lenin didn't really get along. They had differing views on how Soviet communists should expand. Stalin knew that for the Soviet Union to really grow, they needed to expand and grow economically, which involved rapid industrialization. So Stalin was the one responsible for five-year plans. The Soviet five-year plan uh, was for massive industrialization of the cities uh, to be able to catch up with the industrial manufacturing power of Western Europe. Uh, because of this industrialization, there was a migration of peasants from the countryside to the city seeking jobs and work. Uh, there was also the challenge of how to feed the Russian population. In 1929, a program of collectivization was carried out where uh, farmland was confiscated from peasant landowners as well as more wealthy uh, farmland owners, uh, which partly led to loss of production and additional famine. And there was also between famine and direct per persecution of individuals led to another six and a half million deaths. So we'll go through this a little bit quicker. Um, what other factors influenced the, the fate of Poland and indirectly the fate of my, my parents and grandparents? The Treaty of Rapallo in April of 1922 uh, was a remedy to the Treaty of Brest-Livosk, the first settlement between Germany and Russia, settling Russia's involvement in the, sec in the First World War. And this was a way of uh, Germany forgiving Russia its war debt. It also opened the door to secret collaboration on building the German military with manufacture of arms and aircraft, which was forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, Germany was greatly reduced in its capability as a result of the First World War and had strict limitations on the size of their military and location of where their military could be based. Um, 
after that treaty. Here's another picture of uh, Bill Sutsky uh, making a commentary about the Treaty of Locarno. Every honest Pol spits when he hears this word, Locarno. The Treaty of Locarno, uh, signed in uh, December of 1925 in Switzerland, uh, was an agreement between Germany and the Western, uh, its Western neighbors, agreeing uh, to uh, <coughs> renounce the use of force uh, regarding its frontiers, uh, but it also only stipulated arbitration regarding expansion or conflict regarding eastern frontiers. So in Locarno, Great Britain pledged to come to the aid of France if there were to be conflicts, and France agreed to come to the aid of Poland, but Pilsudski knew that France was not as weak as, or not as uh, strong a defender as Britain. So what was going on with our, my ancestors' families? This is a picture of, uh, my grandfather, Walter Panic and his wife, Maria, at a harvest festival in 1926. My, father, my grandfather, Walter, was a World War I veteran. He fought under the Austrian-Hungarian Empire against Russia. He was captured and was a prisoner of war for a year in Russia as a young man. Uh, at the time the war broke out, he was a landowner and was doing very well. He farmed sugar beets, he had livestock, and uh, Together with uh, uh, other farmers, he was working on the formation of a co-op to refine sugar beets uh, shortly before the war broke out. He was active politically with the Peasant Party. Here's another picture of uh, my f grandfather uh, with my Aunt Sophie and my grandmother Maria at a family wedding. My mother's father, Władysław Smoczynski, was a uh, police officer in Poland. He also was involved in active foreign military service under Austria-Hungary. We have uh, his original documentation and records of service from 1916 to 1918 in the First World War, as well as Polish Army Reservist duty and his uh, certification from Police Academy in 1925. And there's a picture of him in the background with uh, local village dignitaries. He was based in Vilno at the time of the, the war, when the war broke out. Well, what was happening to the west of Poland? Uh, Germany, after the First World War, uh, became a republic. The, uh, the emperor, Kaiser, abdicated, and uh, the republic was uh, formed in the city of Weimar. That's where they had the convention to uh, uh, incorporate the republic. The Weimar Republic lasted from 1919 to 1933. Uh, they were affected by the Great De Depression as the world was during the 30s. Uh, there was a political unrest with the rise of right and left-wing paramilitary parties that were struggling for influence in the, in the political system. Uh, when the Reichstag fire occurred in February 28, 1933, uh, a uh, Chancellor Adolf Hitler uh, influenced the, uh, the Premier Hindenburg to nullify civil liberties, and as a result, uh, that allowed the Nazi Socialist Party, National Socialist Party, to gain strength. So while all this was going on, Genoveva Rimwood married Władysław Moczynski. This is my mother's parents. They were married in Rupczyca, Poland. Also at the time, the Russians and Germans were cooperating militarily and economically. Germany had initially hoped to exploit Polish weakness during the Polish-Bolshevik wars and wanted to expand to the east because Germany was impoverished after the First World War, had trouble feeding its own population as Russia did, and saw Poland as a fertile area. Germany was officially neutral regarding the Polish-Bolshevik Wars uh, and uh, participated in the Treaty of Rapallo and Locarno. So just a rundown before we get into a little bit more about what led to the start of the war and how that affected my family. I did some reading and the Soviet party activities are summarized before you. Um, in 1929, the, the Bolsheviks were trying to basically get absolute total control, a totalitarian state, which meant quashing the voices of dissidents, 
or people that were previously allies, but not as ardent supporters of the Bolshevik cause. Over a million people were convicted of crimes in Russia, 1.7 million in 1929. The following year, more than 20,000 were sentenced to death. Obviously, Soviet mismanagement of the economy and collectivization led to starvation. Uh, One million in 32, five million uh, in the Ukraine in 33. And in 1934, there was a great purge of the Communist Party. Two and a half million were arrested and 700,000 Communist Party members were executed. This spread, this scare spread to the Red Army, where the Red Army purge killed 35,000 officers. So what was happening was Stalin was laying the groundwork for the expansion of international communism, as I discussed earlier. Where Russia was impoverished at the time, the success of communism depended on capital. As I said before, the Bolshevik system confiscated all private property that was available within the USSR in the 20s. And Stalin had no choice to ensure the survival of the Soviet system, but to expand to the West. And communist operatives placed in ethnic Polish regions in, of the Western USSR, as well as a Polish Republic, would be the first step in expanding the sphere of influence. I found a citation about, quote unquote, the Polish operation, the genocide of the Polish people in the USSR in the years 37 to 38, where there was under the guise of a suspected spy network of Poles, which it's debatable whether that, there was actually a spy network that maybe would have numbered more than a few dozen people. The NKVD arrested 143,000 ethnic Poles, found 139,000 guilty, and executed 111,000. So that's what Stalin was planning. What was Hitler planning? His master plan was to gain Lebensraum for the Polish people, for the, Ger or for the German people, for the German Republic. Lebensraum is living room. He presented this concept in 1937 for uh, German self-sufficiency. His plan was genocide of neighboring countries and annexation of that territory to gain access to food production and raw materials. And then going hand in hand with this was the Fallweiss plan, which the invasion plan of Poland was signed into power by Hitler in April of 1939. So shortly before the war, I'm sure people in Poland knew what was going on if they read the papers and listened to the radio. But life goes on. Here's a, uh, a photo of my mother with a pet rabbit when she was young. And uh, a picnic where the gentleman Remove their uh, waistcoats and they're playing volleyball. This is my, I think that's my grandfather in the back, my mother's father. There was further cooperation between the Germans and the Soviets with the Molotov von Ribbentrop plan. The plan was to trade uh, military training, raw material, as well as to divine spheres of influence in Eastern Europe in the future. So it's interesting, in this plan, the Germans were used as flying instructors in the Russian Air Force. Russia wanted to build its military. Russian officers were being trained in Germany. But in Russia also, Germany had secret training centers for armor, aircraft, and poison gas. They were trained their own military in Russia. And the secret proto protocol that would divide Eastern Europe into spheres of influence after the war was denied by Russia until 1989. There was also a commercial trade agreement. At the time, as a condition of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany was blockaded from uh, accumulating certain raw materials that could be used for uh, war material. Um, Germany gained access to that through this collaboration with Russia, where Russia would import third party uh, raw materials into Germany. And this is also part of Hitler's two front plan because Hitler knew he would have to attack to the east as well as west to gain access to the living room in the east and then the expansion of Nazism to the west. So about the time of the non-aggression mutual cooperation pact in August, Adolf Hitler 
uh, made this statement to his cabinet. And I'll read it because it's kind of small here. I have given orders to shoot anyone who dares to say one word of criticism because the aim of this war is not to reach a certain objective, but a total annihilation of the enemy. For the time being, therefore, I have placed in the east my units with the death skull insignia, ordering them to shoot without mercy many men and women and children of Polish origin and language. Only in this way and manner we shall be able to acquire living space. Poland will be depleted of its people and populated by Germans. So, where did the war start? In Poland. Poland was the first to fight. The start of hostilities uh, occurred in Gdańsk, or Danzig. As a settlement of the Treaty of Versailles, the First World War, Danzig, or Gdańsk, uh, was a free autonomous state. It was administered jointly uh, through Poland and Germany, uh, but was an independent uh, uh, state. Uh, in uh, Dysk, in an area called Westerplatte, it's a little spit of land in this area here, there was a Polish garrison. And on the left, you can see a, a memorial to the Battle of Westerplatte, where the first shots of the First World War were, uh, occurred. On September 1st, 1939, the battleship Holstein Schleswig, which was actually at anchor in the harbor in Dysk, fired on the Polish garrison at Westerplatte. At the same time, German forces were mobilized from the west to invade the country. And 16, 17 days later, the Soviets came in from the east. And here's a photo taken from Google Images showing a Russian officer uh, greeting a, a, a German officer in Poland. With the occupation of Eastern Poland by the Russians and the institution of Soviet law, because the Russians brought in the NKVD to administer Soviet rule, all Poles automatically became Soviet citizens. Mass migrations followed as many Poles sought to leave for other parts of Poland that were under German control. So people were fleeing the German advance from the west and were homeless in the east. Many were expelled from their homes or apartments to make room for thousands of incoming Soviet officials and their families. So this is essentially what happened to my parents' families. Their dwellings, their homes, their apartments were occupied by Soviet bureaucrats. Many of those uprooted homeless were restricted by the Soviet-issued identity papers from living within 100 kilometers of major cities or the state border. So by September, of the end of September of 39, the Soviets had occupied an area containing 13 million Poles. They brought in their political apparatus and staged a sham referendum in October requesting formal incorporation into the USSR as expansions of Belarus or the Ukraine. So the formal annexation establishment of administration under Ukrainian and Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republics followed. And at the same time, 200,000 Poles were constricted into the Red Army. Polish prisoners of war captured by the Soviets numbered 190,000. And this is from the Keith Sword book, the, the little blue book on the table. Uh, there were over 15,000 officers placed in three separate uh, Russian PO, uh, W camps. But it not only included military officers, but officials, landowners, priests, policemen, prison wardens, military colonists who were uh, individuals who fought in the service of the Austrian Empire and then were awarded land in eastern Poland, uh, military policemen, members of the Frontier Defense Force and Border Guards were all taken prisoner. At the time the war broke out, uh, the Polish government decided to take exile and they moved, they escaped along with multiple Polish forces via Romania to France. Uh, Władysław Sikorski was Prime Minister of Poland from 1922 to 23 and Minister of Military Affairs from 23 to 24 and he was quickly appointed prime minister of the Polish government in exile under President Radziewicz. Uh, they initially settled in Paris 
And then as Hitler broke out in the Western Front, having invaded the Netherlands in May of 1940, uh, France uh, was having difficulty uh, stemming the, the Nazi advance. Uh, the Polish government in exile eventually settled in London. The government in exile was a coalition of the Polish Peasant Party, Polish Socialist Party, the Labor Party, and the National Party. One of the critical functions of the government in exile was maintaining diplomatic relations with the Allied forces, uh, the, the French and the uh, British. Safeguarding Polish assets was a priority to assure support of Poles displaced by the war and to support the military forces of the Polish government. National treasures, including an original Gutenberg Bible, the traditional royal coronation sword dating to the 1300s, Jagiellonian dynasty tapestries, as well as the earliest documents of the Polish language, and Polish composer Frederick Chopin's autographed sheet music were some of these tra uh, treasures that were secreted out of the country and uh, found safekeeping ultimately in Canada. Transfer of Polish gold bullion would be one of the factors in the survival of many Poles during and after the war. They were able to transport 79 and a half tons of gold bullion out of the country shortly before the Soviets arrived. If you want to read an interesting story, you can access this online, just uh, Google Polish gold. And uh, this was a report put together by the uh, National Bank of Poland, Narodowy Bank Polski, uh, about the fate of the Polish gold. And I'll read a little bit of the story for you because it's quite fascinating. And my dad says that this Polish gold kept him alive when he was a refugee. The historical report was put together by the bank in 2014 and contains eyewitness accounts of the events involved. Nine days before the Soviet invasion, it was decided to move the Polish government gold bullion to France because France was an ally. France had pledged to come to the defense of Poland under the Treaty of Locarno. On September 13, 1939, almost 80 tons of gold was trucked to the Romanian border and then transported under the cover night to the port of Constanta. Four tons were deposited in Romania for use by Polish military and the rest shipped to Istanbul. The gold was subsequently trucked through Syria to French-controlled Beirut, Lebanon. On the 23rd of September 1939, it was transported to France and deposited in the Bank of France in Nevers, France. When Germany attacked France in the spring of 1940, the Polish government requested shipment of the gold to the USA. The French delayed during the hostilities on the Western Front and subsequently shipped the gold to Dakar, Africa, where they had outposts in the, in the Sahara Desert. France fell to the Germans with a truce of June 22, 1940, forming the Vichy government, putting the safety of the gold into question. Charles de Gaulle of the Free French Movement pledged to return the gold to the Poles, but was unsuccessful. The government in exile subsequently sued in a U.S. federal court, gaining access to French gold of equal value on deposit in the New York Federal Reserve Bank. As the war progressed, the Polish gold was eventually shipped out of Africa and deposited in London, New York, and Ottawa, Canada. The security of this gold deserve allowed the government in exile to fund the activities of the Polish underground army, as well as provide support to Polish civilian refugees. So time for a little break. I'll entertain some questions now. Yes? Yeah, uh, you said the national treasure. Canada? Yes. Are they, where are they now? They've been repatriated to Poland, but that didn't occur until the Polish government changed from the communist to the current republic. So that, that's an interesting story, too. If you want to find something, you know, Google that story, because it's fascinating. All the mach machinations that went on, you know, people were, they were actually um, the custodians, the, uh, the museum, Keepers, uh, because the treasures were kept at the Wawel Castle in Krakow. So the people that were the custodians of these treasures traveled with the items and um, found places to secrete them. And I think one was in a monastery in, in Canada. And, and it's interesting how there were lawsuits that had to be filed for the Polish government to get this back. <coughs> 
Yes. Yes. I wonder, was the Hague against the Russian in the same thing to Jewish people that the Hague was against the Russians? So that's a good question. Um, they didn't have a philosophical rationale to single out the Jewish populations. Their interest was quashing anyone who was anti-Bolshevik or anti-Soviet. 